Jesus has a lot of strange parables. Of Jesus' many strange, confounding, and perplexing parable, this is the strangest, most confounding, most compl- uh, perplexing, and most outrageous of them all, or at least it's in the top 10, but this is a real doozy, to which many of the scholars who help preachers figure these things out, they've said, good luck. As you heard Ben Reed, the master praised the crooked manager because, quote, he knew how to look after himself. Or the more traditional form of this is the master praised the dishonest manager because he had, quote, acted shrewdly. What do you think Jesus would have said about Fred? Fred promised God, I'll sell my house and give all the money to the poor if you solve my problem. And one day he realized he'd have to make good on his promise. So Fred put his house on the market with the caveat, you must also take my cat too. He listed the house for the sum of one dollar and the cat came along for the bargain price of one hundred thousand dollars. When the house sold, Fred promptly and proudly gave the entire proceeds to the poor. He had said nothing about the cat. Was he just being shrewd? I mean that seems like a pretty smart thing to do. But it's wealth gained by dishonest means, and you you mean Jesus doesn't care about that? So our lunch and lectionary group on Thursday really wrestled with this text, and as you can imagine, we had a lot of questions, but we did have an interesting insight. We talked about people who come up with so many different scams, like those emails that pretend to be the pastor asking you to buy gift cards, because of some kind of emergency? Who comes up with these ideas? Well, we thought, the text says, I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what's right. As it claims, streetwise people are smarter than law-abiding citizens. I don't know about that. Use every adversity for creative survival. Concentrate on the bare essentials. And if you do, you'll live. You'll really live and not be complacent or just get by on good behavior. So I think, okay, I I understand a little of what Jesus might be saying here, be as smart as the scammers, but for good. But even if that's the, the, even that's what it's saying, I I still know we're supposed to do with it. And maybe that's the point. So C.H. Dodd defines a parable as a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life, arresting the hearer by its vividness or strangeness, and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise application to tease it into active thought. So here's another way to say that. The parable is a story to which listeners can easily relate. It welcomes us in and then takes a strange turn and leaves us with enough doubt as to not know exactly what to do with it, and therefore it causes us to think. There's not always a moral at the end of a parable, and sometimes that is frustrating. There's supposed to be a moral at the end of the story, something that wraps it all up in a nice big bow, but parables defy that expectation is why after 30 years I can always still find something new in the text. So what is the what is the context? Where is this placed? The parable of the dishonest manager is right in the middle of a whole bunch of other parables and teachings about wealth and poverty including involving tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees and legal experts. Verse 14 that immediately follows, it really should be attached to the reading, it says, the Pharisees heard all this and sneered at Jesus. They sneered because they loved money. They were money lovers. They were obsessed with money. And the very next parable, which we'll hear next week, is of what happened after a poor man named Lazarus and a rich man died. So 
I want to make it clear that Jesus doesn't condemn people for having money. He invites us into a proper relationship with it. So to those obsessed with money, he often invited them to give it away for their own good because it was their obsession. Jesus said it's impossible to serve God and money equally because money is meant to serve God, not God to serve money. Now, you've probably heard the phrase, money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not what it actually says in the Bible. The, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in 2 Timothy it says, some have wandered away from the faith and have impaled themselves with a lot of pain because they made money their goal. Remember, Jesus relied on the wealth, especially of women, to support his ministry. But into this mix, somehow, today's parable seems to praise those who obtain wealth through dishonest means. And you know, that seems like an especially disconcerting message as we present Bibles to elementary school children and encourage them to read it. And perhaps it should come with caution tape around it. The Bible includes more than a few stories that are inappropriate for children, like Ruth uncovering Boaz's feet before they were married. I mean, there's, there's enough in it that it should probably be banned from libraries for explicit content. <laughs> when you think about it, the Bible is sometimes violent. It seeks retribution against enemies, portrays a God who is vengeful, celebrates conquerors, and praises immoral victories. And no matter how cute the little animals going two by two into the ark might be, everyone is drowned in a great flood sent by God. The Bible tells of a worldview we often don't agree with and represents without question cultural norms on things like women and slavery that we find appalling. The Bible, which <laughs> the most recent part is 2,000 years ago, is so far removed from us that it doesn't understand the world we live in. The Bible often leaves us offended with more questions than answers more confused than confident. And frankly, as I told the children, it's often boring. You forget the sleeping pill, turn in the middle of the night to First Chronicles. <laughs> the 27th chapter tells us that the eighth army commander for the eighth month was someone whose name I can't pronounce from some group I've never heard of or from some place that may not still exist. And for some reason we call it Holy Scripture. Ultimately, however, the, God, the Bible does tell us of a God who doesn't give up on us no matter how willful or clueless humans are. And ironically, despite the thousands of years between then and now, the Bible does in fact understand the complexity of our world. We know that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Human behavior is human behavior. And it does challenge us to confront the cultural norms we find appalling today. Now indeed, the Bible does often leave us with more questions than answers, more confused than confident, but that's good because it's not a book of rules. It's a collection of books written by people who are as confused and as hopeful as we are struggling to put this whole thing we call life together and live it in a meaningful way. We are among people who agree there is more to this world than we can see. One of the best things the Bible teaches is that in our age of instant everything, we are part of a time that is eternal. And we are part of continuing generations. We don't know how or when, but a life of faith is to do our part to make things right from whatever wrong was done in previous generations so that we keep moving forward for the next. Through the teachings of Jesus and the grace of God to the vision of a world where the wolves will lie down with the lambs and a little child shall lead us. 
It means we never give up hope. Now, sometimes the Bible gets a little too personal, and maybe Jesus talks about money a little too much, but he never stops asking us to find a satisfying life through generosity. A satisfying life comes through generosity to always care for widows and orphans, whoever they might be in our world today, and welcome strangers and aliens from wherever they come in every age. In the Bible, we are confronted with our faults and failures and lead us to find value in our faults and failures because everything that happens can lead to good, even the crucifixion of God's own child. The Bible teaches that no one is ever too far gone, nothing we've done is ever so awful that it can't be redeemed by grace. Not because of the things we do to make up for it. It asks our simple, it, it accepts our simple asking for forgiveness as enough. There is mercy. There's also accountability. And there's reconciliation. There's also repair to be made. And yet the bottom line is that there is the possibility always of rehabilitation. There is the possibility always of restoration. Always, always, and always there is the opportunity to change. We don't always hear that in our world today. If there wasn't always the opportunity to change, we would only become angrier and more distant from one another. That's good for no one. So back to our children, as I think of the world they're growing up in, full of anger and hatred and often a feel that some people are beyond help because of their beliefs or actions. We need people who will never give up on our neighbors. We can be angry and disappointed, but no one is ever so far gone that what they've done, and especially what we've done, cannot be redeemed and used for good. Because as Paul told the Romans, there is nothing in all of creation that will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Love. Ah, love. Yes. Love. That's really the continuing and repeating story of the Bible. <laughs> and you know how messy love is? And you know how wonderful love is? And you know how awful love is? And you know how beautiful love is? I'm grateful that my job requires me to wrestle with these texts, these perplexing questions about life and find meaning. And I'll admit to having a sometimes love-hate relationship with the Bible. Having heard the Bible used as a weapon against you, we'll do that. But I can't imagine basing my life on anything else because it, it provides a structure and a framework around which to ask questions, to be challenged. We all need to be challenged or everything becomes about us. We just take from the Bible what gives life and leave what doesn't behind. And I encourage you to give it a read too. Just a little bit, you know, something simple. Don't start at the beginning and try to make your way all the way to the end. I guarantee you'll lose interest at the listing of the eighth commander of the eighth month and the ninth and the twelfth and the fourteenth. And if you've made it that far, God bless you. Start by reading just one gospel. Fine, that's, that's, that's really enough. Try, try Luke. You find it interesting? then try Matthew. If you don't understand it, don't worry, I don't always either. It might start making more sense the more you engage with it. So try Luke, just somewhere along the way. And then move on to Matthew, move on to Mark. Maybe you'll be interested in learning a little more. And if you have a question, ask me. 
And you can always join us on Zoom on Thursdays for lunch and a good conversation. But let me assure you, in this baffling book, being perplexed about what it says is much better than knowing exactly what it says. Can I say that one again just so you get an amen to go with it? Being perplexed by what it says is much better than knowing exactly what it says. Why else would Jesus use the method of perplexing parables to tell his story? Because it means he believes we can keep learning and growing, and, and we will keep growing and understanding, though I'm not sure I'll ever understand how wealth gained by dishonest means is a good thing. And not knowing, it's okay. Amen.